right, my friends. Well, I want to start us off with a question. The question is, what is a kingdom? What is a kingdom? This is not a rhetorical question. Who, uh, who would like to give some feedback on that? What do we think of when we think kingdom? Anybody at all? You got a ruler. You got a ruler. Got to start there. That's right. That's right. King or queen. And it's a certain area. Yes. And all of those people within that area are beholden and responsible for occupying that. Yeah, absolutely. Did you guys look at my notes? Or. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we go to our faithful Miriam Webster, and we have a country whose ruler is a king or a queen. Another definition could be a. It's a region, because you have to talk about area, a region in which something or someone has a very strong influence. In this case, would be a king. Another way you could think about kingdom is it's a, it's a society of people. I like this definition. A kingdom is a society of people who are under a king, and that kingdom will naturally be wherever that king's citizens are, Wherever the citizens are, there the kingdom is. And wherever that king's authority extends to geographically. Right? We understand this. For, for example, right? we think of Nebuchadnezzar. Right? The, the king of Babylon ruled over the area, of the empire of Babylon, over the people of Babylon. That land area and group of individuals... It did change, it fluctuated, it shifted from time to time, but by and large, the place where the subjects are is the kingdom ruled by a king. We understand this concept. So when we think about the kingdom of God, we think about the kingdom of God, I would argue that those categories should not vastly change. We're talking about a very similar thing. We're talking about a similar thing. We think about the Old Testament, for example, where God began the building of a kingdom through the setting apart of one man. We're back in Genesis 12. Silas, what was his name? What? Who did God set apart in Genesis 12? Who was that one special man? The man that God set apart for a very specific purpose. Genesis 12. Abraham. There you go, Bob. Abraham. So he promised to make from this man and his descendants a great and holy nation, right? A, a kingdom. As we studied last semester, right, in the Old Testament, within 400 years of God setting Abraham apart uh, to make him this mighty nation, it, it comes to fruition in the people of Israel. God covenants with the people through Moses. I would think of Exodus 19, 20, 21. Right, where God sets this people apart, giving them his law, and officially establishing them as a kingdom of priests, as he calls them, a, a holy nation. In other words, the kingdom of God on earth, on the ground, the people, the subjects of the king. And it's important for us to remember that this kingdom, this Old Testament kingdom, was not fundamentally... An, an ethnic biological kingdom. There were, this was a family in many ways, but ultimately it was a covenantal kingdom. Not primarily a biological kingdom, but a covenantal kingdom. Because regardless of your ethnicity, you could become a part of covenant Israel um, through circumcision and adherence to the king. The, the word of the king, the law. We see this, for example, in the mixed multitude that leaves Egypt, right? You, you pray you would have been one of those Egyptians who saw the plagues and, and, and you say, I want to go with them. I'll, I'll serve that God, right? The Bible tells us that many Egyptians went and became Israelites. Uh, we think of women like Rahab, for example, Rahab or Ruth, right? From pagan nations who become Israel through the covenant of God. So anyone, anyone could yield themselves to Yahweh the king and become a legitimate citizen of his kingdom on earth. Now for many centuries, 
Israel had no human king. That era in the Old Testament, right? Because God was her king. God established his rule and reign over Israel through his word and his laws. And Israel, as subjects to the king, the heavenly king, were responsible to live as faithful kingdom citizens. That was their role as his, uh, his people. Eventually, though, Israel wanted to be like the other nations, didn't they? And they wanted to have a human king on earth. And so God granted this request, though it was essentially them rejecting him as king, right? We want to be like the nations of earth. And so he allowed it. He, he remained faithful to his people, but he did give them a human king, it's a long line of human kings. And as we know, there were some good ones in that, in that batch of kings. There were some good kings, but by and large, most of them were sinful. Most of them were wicked kings, typically worse than their fathers were. If you read through First and Second Kings, there's a, there's a trend, there's a pattern there. Uh, sending Israel into kind of this downward spiral of evil throughout Judges and eventually the downfall of Israel in the exile and the removal of their land, the removal from their, the land that God had given them. It, it, there, there's no lower point as a kingdom citizen than to be subjected to and taken away by another king, right? And that's exactly what happened in the exile. Uh, we think of the, the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. This kingdom was conquered in a sense. Um, yet as we learned in the spring semester, the prophets, the prophets during these exilic times foretold of a future day when a true and better messianic king, messiah king, would come to rule over God's kingdom. So the prophets are all excited about, right, over the centuries. This messiah, his rule and his reign would be one of righteousness and, and peace, godliness, and a covenantal kingdom which both Jews and Gentiles could be citizens in. Again, it's a covenantal kingdom. And then we arrive in the New Testament, right? Where the last great prophet, John the Baptist, arrives on the scene, right? Some say he kind of, he, he, he has an Old Testament vibe to him. He's, he's kind of like the Old Testament guy that happened to end up in the New. <laughs> and he's, he's this prophet and his message is that he is paving the way for the messianic king. Right? That's, that's who he is. That's how, who he understands himself to be. Um, go ahead and turn to the book of Matthew. We're going to look at a few passages in Matthew this morning. We think, for example, Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3, verse 1. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And here's this message. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And this is he, Matthew is very clear about this, this is he uh, who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And then we meet, the Lord Jesus. And, and his message, as it turns out, is in perfect alignment with that of John the Baptist, right? After we think of uh, Matthew 4, look over at Matthew 4 17. After Jesus defeats Satan in the wilderness, it says, From that time, Matthew 4 17, from that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was in lockstep with John the Baptist there. And the, the message is that this long-awaited kingdom of God, restored kingdom of God, uh, or kingdom of heaven, as it's called sometimes, was at hand. It was near. You could grab it. It was close. That's the message. And people ought to repent and prepare uh, for, this, for this kingdom. By the way, I believe, people, people vary on this, I believe the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are... are uh, the same, the same, they're speaking of the same reality, the same kingdom there. Um, there's some interesting things written about how Matthew 
writing to a primarily Jewish audience, wants to avoid the use of the, the word God, right, to, to offend the people. You don't want to overuse that, so he uses kingdom of heaven. But I believe they're one and the same. Um, so, what do, we, what do we want to accomplish this morning with the arrival of Jesus? We talked a little bit about his arrival last week. Well, what I want us to take is five lessons from Jesus. So I've kind of boiled down this morning. Five lessons from Jesus about the kingdom of God. Five lessons from Jesus about the kingdom of God. Okay? So number one, the kingdom of God arrived when the king arrived. That makes sense, right? The, the king shows up. Here's, here's the kingdom. Uh, Mark 1.15. And saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Again, this is the core message uh, of Jesus and his, his preaching. Um, Luke chapter 4. Luke 4 kind of helps us see the, the priority of Jesus and his message. Uh, This is Luke 4.42. It says, When it was day, he departed and went into a desolate place. And the people sought him and came to him and would have kept him from leaving them. Remember, he's healing people left and right. But he said to them, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. Right? So Jesus came to to do a lot of things, but chiefly among them is preaching the good news of the kingdom. So the kingdom arrived. It's very natural for us to see the kingdom arrived when the king arrived. Um, Turn with me quickly to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Because the arrival of the kingdom... Coinciding with the arrival of the king is exactly what the prophets of old predicted. Turn to Daniel, Daniel 2, because we'll remember this from last semester. We talked about Nebuchadnezzar's dreams, right? His dream, and specifically that one about that statue, the gold, the silver, the bronze, right? And the, the iron and clay it represented earthly kingdoms, as we talked about. Um, the kingdoms of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. And ultimately Rome. Look with me at Daniel 2 if you're there. Daniel 2.40. And there shall be, Daniel says, there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. So these other kingdoms. And here again, we're speaking of the, the Roman Empire. It was unique. It was the strongest. It was the largest. It was the most dominant that the world had ever seen. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It, the kingdom of God, shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand Forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, bronze, clay and silver and gold. A great God has made known to the king, to Nebuchadnezzar, what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So we get both. We get the dream and we get the clear prophetic interpretation. Because you remember that story, the stone comes out of heaven and destroys these kingdoms. Well, lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, the Lord Jesus arrives right in the middle of what empire? What thriving, dominant empire, which, which had spanned from, from India to Ethiopia, the biggest empire the world had ever seen, the Roman Empire. And here comes Jesus saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? That's, that's meaningful. That helps us orient and figure out where we are at the arrival of King Jesus. So the kingdom arrived, I would argue, when the king arrived. And, and this king wasted no time advancing the mission of this kingdom. Healing being a major aspect of that mission. Right? Healing being a major aspect. 
So again, we're looking at five lessons from Jesus on the kingdom of God. Number two is that the kingdom of God brings restorative physical healing. The kingdom of God brings restorative physical healing. Remember Jesus' message to the Nazarenes uh, in the synagogue. Remember at the very beginning of his ministry, this is back in Luke 4, he arrives there in Nazareth and he reads to them from the prophet Isaiah. This is Luke 4.18. I know I'm jumping around a little bit. I apologize. Luke 4, 18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then in verse 21 Jesus says, he looks around at the room, they're all kind of amazed at his words and his authority, and he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And as we well know, the rest of Jesus' ministry is full of physical healings. He's he's healing everybody. He's reversing the effects of the fall through healing of things like sickness and Disease pointing, I believe, to a future world where sickness and disease have no place. Ultimately, in a, in a final sense, eschatological sense, there will be no sickness and disease. Right? There will be no death. And he's pointing us to that. So the kingdom of God, number two, brings restorative physical healing. But number three, as you can probably guess, the kingdom of God also brings restorative spiritual healing. Kingdom of God brings restorative spiritual healing. Jesus went beyond the physical when he offered things like the forgiveness of sins. Jesus did that. He walked around telling people, you're forgiven. (laughs) Go and be blessed, right? Go and sin no more. Uh, the, The moral, spiritual restoration of humanity came, or at least began, when Christ arrived. One example of this is his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. So here we're back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. This Sermon on the Mount is, is essentially the, the code of conduct. The, the, uh, what does it look like to be a citizen of the kingdom of God? And here we have Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's restoration. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Those are, those are spiritually restorative qualities that you can partake in when you're in this kingdom. This kingdom of God. Jesus was teaching, again, the terms and the characteristics of the kingdom of of God and being a citizen therein, providing both physical and spiritual healing. Jump with me over to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. Important passage for us to look at here. Um, because Jesus, as we know, demonstrated this, this restoration frequently through the, the cleansing, the casting out of demons. Right? We see it all throughout his ministry. He's not healing an illness. He's casting out a demon somewhere. Um, And again, we see it all throughout the Gospels. He comes with authority to release his people from satanic bondage. And what do the demons do? They run and flee. (laughs) They know him. They see him coming. They know who he is. They know why he's here. Uh, And we see that in these exorcisms. Uh, So again, Matthew 12, starting in verse 22 says, then a, a demon oppressed man who was blind and mute, interestingly, so you got physical and spiritual, demon oppressed, not rightly functioning physically, blind and mute. He was brought to him and he healed him so that the man spoke and saw and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, 
It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons, right? So here we have a spiritual and physical healing. And Jesus says, uh, verse, verse 25, knowing their thoughts. He's in their minds. <laughs> he, knows, he knows what they're thinking. Knowing their thoughts. He said to them, kind of let me teach you about kingdoms here for a minute. Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And so if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? It's not going to work. He's he's teaching. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. Look at verse 28. But if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, if that be the case, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God is here, if in fact I'm doing this by the Holy Spirit. So again, this is, then he gives this prophetic illustration uh, about his, his purpose in these satanic uh, bindings and exorcisms. Verse 29, Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder his house. So what's, what's crazy about this illustration is Jesus is the robber in the scenario. <laughs> Jesus is the robber here, and, and Satan is the strong man whose, whose house, his world domain, is about to be plundered. Right? He, Jesus is on the offense here. So he was teaching that in these healings and these exorcisms, he was beginning the process of, of pushing back the kingdom of darkness and unveiling the kingdom of light to the world. These are meaningful acts that, that he goes about doing. He was exercising authority over both the physical and the spiritual realm, demonstrating that he was, in fact, the king of God's kingdom. So, the kingdom of God brings physical and spiritual restoration and healing. Uh, look with me at Matthew 13. <coughs> Move quickly to number four on our list. Lessons from Jesus on the kingdom of God. Number four is Jesus wants to teach us about the nature of the kingdom as well. The kingdom of God begins small and advances gradually. The kingdom of God begins small and advances gradually. So again, obviously we don't have time to work through all the kingdom parables, um, but I think these These two give us a good understanding of how this kingdom works and and what it looks like. So Matthew 13, verse 31. He put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants. And becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, if you've you've recently read through some of Daniel and Nebuchadnezzar, you'll remember that God used this sort of language to describe the kingdom he had given Nebuchadnezzar. The king of Babylon. You have have all authority, uh, Nebuchadnezzar. You're, You're thriving. The nations are coming and bowing before you. This is kingdom language. And Jesus applies it to the kingdom of God that will be the the largest and the greatest of all kingdoms. Then we look at verse 33. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. Again, the, the principle being it begins small and it permeates. It advances gradually. So these parables show us the, the kind of gradual, incremental, little by little nature of the kingdom of God. It begins small, it works slowly, but eventually it grows into the most dominant kingdom the world has ever seen. By the way, here we are still talking about it. 2,000 years after these words were taken down, on the other side of the, the planet, we're on the other side of the ball <laughs> from where these things took place. 
And here we are. Um, now, as we consider some, some eschatology here, some different eschatological views on this point, this is, this is one of those areas where we see a stark contrast in Christian traditions on eschatology. Okay, so some, some would hold to a theology which says Christ attempted to establish his kingdom on earth at that time, and he failed to do so. And so in essence, that, that plan has been paused for 2,000 plus years, and it will pick up again later, someday in the future, when Jesus physically returns to the world. The kingdom project has started, and then it stopped. Now it's paused, and it will pick up again later. So in this view, the kingdom, again, is a, it's a later end of the world sort of idea which we anticipate in the future by and large this would be the general understanding of premillennialism premillennialism the idea that Christ when he returns then the kingdom of God will begin a couple issues with that for me personally one of the reasons I, I, I struggle with this view is because scripture never teaches us that in all this language of the kingdom being at hand, the kingdom being around the corner, Scripture never teaches us that the kingdom is going to come and then leave and then come back. We don't have anything clear in the Bible on that, I believe. Jesus declared his work was finished, after all, on the cross. He did not say, I tried, it failed, let's pick it up again later. Another issue I take is, is that this paints a picture of an instant, all-at-once kingdom later, uh, sort of a, a dropping out of the sky at a future date, all-at-once kingdom, which conflicts with the slow, incremental, gradual growth of the kingdom that we learn about from Jesus. Because again, we have to think, what, what is a kingdom? Right? A kingdom is, by definition, a, a society of people who are under a king. That kingdom will naturally be wherever the king's citizens are, and it will happen wherever the king's authority extends to geographically. So in Christ's case, what kind of authority does he have? He has authority in all of heaven and all of earth. The king is seated at the right hand of God, right, having been given all authority, and we, his citizens, are down here. We're, we're boots on the ground. Uh, and so in contrast to a premillennial view, most postmillennialists or amillennialists would agree that Christ successfully began his kingdom back in the first century and has been slowly, gradually building it and expanding it uh, on the earth throughout the course of 2,000 plus years. It's an advancing kingdom. This kingdom is not, you know, you think back to the Old Testament, this kingdom is not fundamentally an ethnic, biological kingdom. Rather, it's a covenantal kingdom. It's built on the promises of God. Regardless of your ethnicity, just like with ancient Israel, you, could, you can become a part of Christ's kingdom through repentance and faith. Anyone can yield themselves to Christ as the king, and be a legitimate citizen of his kingdom on earth. And he will continue, I believe, to advance this kingdom until that great and final day when he does physically return to the earth. So the kingdom of God begins small and advances gradually. Thus, I think it is fitting. So point number five, our last one. Point number five. If you have time for it. If you have time for number five. Awesome. Number five. The citizens of the kingdom of God should pray for the advancement of the kingdom of God. You ought to pray that way. So think about the Lord's Prayer. Again, they, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us. How do we do this? Matthew 6, 9. Pray then like this, Jesus says. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, glorified, magnified be the name of Yahweh. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So when he's asked, how do we pray? Jesus answers that they should pray that God's kingdom come into the world more and more. 
for the, for the king's desires and will and purposes to advance more and more here, here on earth. And I think it would be very odd for Jesus to teach this is the standard for prayer if he knew God had no intention of ever answering that prayer. Wouldn't that be strange? I think it makes much more sense to say that God intends to bring this prayer request to fruition. Right? He, he intends to say yes and amen over a long span of time. Kind of like the time it takes to plant a little tiny seed and watch a tree grow. <laughs> hunker down for the long haul sort of a deal um and so i believe it's right that the citizens of god's kingdom pray for the advancement of the kingdom on earth so a couple just real quick closing thoughts as we wrap this up um i'll stick around after if you want to talk a little more ask some questions um as we consider these things about the kingdom of god from my eschatological perspective i would argue that jesus is not will, but is ruling and reigning now from the highest seat of authority there is in the heavens. He is in the process of exercising his righteous kingly dominion, again, from the highest throne there is over his kingdom citizens to this very day. And those of us who, who humbly bow and give our lives to his service are those who will inherit the eternal reward at the end of of the world when the kingdom is fully established and consummated in the completed new heavens and new earth so for now what do we do we, we are his again we're his foot foot soldiers right we are his boots on the ground his his hands and feet in the world and so our mission is to use our strength and our skills and our possessions everything that he's given us to advance his kingdom that's that's why we're here that's why we're here. We're not here to, to just wait to be raptured out, right? There will be a rapture one day. However, we've got work to do. We need to be vigilant, right? We need to have our eyes open and watching. So we use our gifts. You think of the parable of the talents. We use, while the king is away, we use what he's given us to invest, to invest in his kingdom. We use our voices to share the gospel of the kingdom, to make disciples, in our homes and communities. We use our minds to learn and grow and meditate on the words of the king, the message of the king. We use our hands to, to skillfully build and enhance and create and cultivate, right? The things that God has given us um, to, to be glorified with. And, and we do it all to bring him glory and honor as the king to the watching world, right? The world around us, our neighbors, our friends, our families. They're curious. Why, why, are, why are you giving your life to this? Why do you go to church every Sunday? Why do you, why do you pour over the pages of this book? Well, it's, it's the words of the king. And it's, it's my mission to, to advance this kingdom uh, in whatever little small way I can in my corner of the world. That's, that's why we're here. That the world might see our good deeds, hear our message, and glorify our King. Amen.